Greetings, true believers! I'm Funky Monkey. Welcome to my house of love! How do you top such a phenomenal explosive movie as Iron Man? Do you raise the stakes, adding not one, but two villains? Do you add in new armors, new weapons, and increase the scope? Or do you keep it small, focus less on the iron, and more on the man? All of which assumes that they needed to try after the first movie blew away expectations, but try they did, and all of their effort resulted in 2010's sensational sequel, Iron Man 2. This time around, Tony's alter ego is known to the world, which isn't such good news when the son of a former Stark employee sets his sights on Tony's empire as does a US Senator who argues that the Iron Man suit should be used to defend the USA from copycat attacks. And worse, in the run-up to Tony's birthday, he discovers that the arc reactor that's keeping him alive is also killing him. Now, it's easy to see why people like this film. It's the same mix of action, improvised dialogue, and Robert Downey Jr. basically being himself. Along with a couple of nods to the franchise building to follow. And of course, there's bound to be a few people, even in this information age, who are saying to themselves, Who is this Iron Man character? What's he all about? What colour is Tuesday? Well, Tuesdays are blue, donuts are plentiful, and for the uninitiated, I present a short biography of Anthony Edward Stark, the Iron Man. Created in 1963 by Larry Lieber and his more famous brother Stan, alongside Jack Kirby and Don Heck, Iron Man was initially an experiment in taking a character that would seem to be everything that the fans would hate in a person and making this character relatable. Given the anti-war sentiments, making Tony Stark the head of a weapons manufacturing corporation would seem like commercial suicide. And yet, under the careful guidance of the brothers Lieber, being, of course, Larry and Stan, and Stan is, as you've probably guessed, the self-aggrandizing Stan Lee, the tale of a gunsmith executive with a quite literal broken heart proved popular enough to continue featuring in the comic Tales of Suspense, which lasted for five years, until Iron Man was given his own title, which debuted in May 1968. The origin of Iron Man has changed little in the 45 plus years since it was first told. Tony is captured by insurgents, wounded with shrapnel in his chest, imprisoned and forced to build a weapon. Instead, with the help of a Nobel Prize winning scientist, he creates a suit of armour that will allow him to live. And thus the Iron Man is born. Over time though, Tony becomes ever more disillusioned as the Vietnam conflict drags on and reconsiders his gung-ho stance on creating military weaponry. Pouring his fortune instead into equipping factions such as S.H.I.E.L.D. and the Avengers, Tony also continues to refine the Iron Man armour, from the bulky Mark I to the Golden Avenger suit with new flight capabilities to the red and gold armour that we're more familiar with. Tony's personal life is no less eventful. Rampages, murders, falling out some reconciliations in droves, and even a battle with the bottle, which very much mirrors Robert Downey Jr.'s battle with drugs, but we'll get to that. More recently, Tony has taken on roles in government, all the way up to US Secretary of Defense even. And in the aftermath of the Civil War, Director of S.H.I.E.L.D which led to him personally overseeing several of their operations. Sadly, he was dethroned by scandal, and hunted by a resurgent Norman Osborn. But that situation resolved itself when Osborn overplayed his hand. And of course, it wouldn't be right of me to conclude this history of Iron Man without mentioning James Rhodey Rhodes, the War Machine. First appearing very early on in the run, Rhodey has gone on to become one of Tony's closest friends. The first time Rhodey takes up the Iron Man suit is when, after a run of seeming bad luck, which is in reality a rival's manipulations and scheming, 
A relapsed and drunken Tony is defeated. Rhodey steps in to exact revenge for his comrade and temporarily becomes Iron Man. This was never meant to be permanent though. And once Tony was sober and had a new company going, Rhodey stepped aside. Only to return to the role when Tony was shot and paralysed by a crazed former lover. It was around this time that the War Machine armour first debuted. Eventually though, Tony repairs his broken body, reclaims the role of Iron Man, and Rhodey takes the alias of War Machine. Along with the suit, which has been destroyed and replaced multiple times, but to the casual observer, doesn't really look any different. And I would mention some of the myriad arcs of the side characters, the supporting cast of thousands as not seen in the movies, and some of the adventures that Iron Man had with the Avengers, which he actually led for a time. But I've rambled on long enough, and I think it's time to get to the movie itself. Iron Man 2 starts six months after the events of Iron Man. Tony is enjoying a wave of popularity as he unveils the Stark Expo. But he's hiding a dark secret, as the palladium that powers his arc reactor is poisoning his blood. This is the movie's strength. As the stakes are changed, not just raised, Iron Man was a movie about a playboy inventor weapons manufacturer finding himself. In this movie, Tony has to come to terms with his rapidly impending mortality and the possibility that he's not leaving behind the legacy he wants. In appointing Pepper to run Stark Industries, he's effectively leaving her the company to run after he's gone. And the heart-wrenching scene where Tony and Rhodey face off in their respective suits, he knows that the government want the Iron Man suit, so he's giving them a suit, and making it look like Rhodey just took it. But this movie is also about legacy, both in the form of inheriting the past, in the form of Tony's father Howard, who gives his son the key to the future, and the building of the franchise, in the form of Natalie Rushman, alias Natasha Romanoff, the Black Widow. Another point about this movie is the existence of the Dark Mirrors both in the form of the superficially charming Justin Hammer, played with great relish by Sam Rockwell, and the grizzled visage of Ivan Vonko, son of the Arc Reactor's co-creator Anton. Vonko sees Tony Stark and uses his father's knowledge to create his own miniaturised Arc Reactor. Hammer catches wind of this and introduces Vonko to a vastly upgraded laboratory all in the hope of putting Tony's nose out of joint. Sadly, this doesn't play out. Justin Hammer, who was originally an old Englishman in the comics, is very much the billionaire playboy, all swagger and showmanship, with no real design behind it. The movie very much plays it for laughs, a hotshot CEO very much in the old style of international jet-setting playboys, a merchant of death, if you will, whose very business was obsoleted the day Tony Stark woke up in a cave and turned a pile of scrap metal into the Mark I Iron Man. Vanko, by contrast, serves more as a mirror to Tony's genius. Anton Vanko, Ivan's father, whose last moments kick off this movie, had always felt betrayed by Howard Stark. Together, the two men created the Arc Reactor, the clean energy solution that Stark believed would create a warm light for all mankind. Vanko, however, was only in it for the money, and so his son took up the quest for vengeance, leading to the showdown in Monaco. Of course, the most prominent theme of all in these movies, at least up until the final action climax that is, is the theme of self-destruction. And self-destruction is a subject that actor Robert Downey Jr. knows only too well. The thing most people won't know about Robert Downey Jr. is that his early life was centred around narcotics of several different kinds. Bonding with his father, Robert Downey Sr., was often done over some kind of drug. This, however, can be seen in the context of the 1960s and 1970s counterculture, which was the time that Downey Jr. was growing up. In 1982, Robert Downey Jr. moved to California to seek his acting fortunes. After three years in theatre, Downey joined Saturday Night Live in the 1985 intake, 
Sadly, 1985 wasn't a vintage year for SNL. Iron Man wasn't RDJ's first brush with art imitating life, though. In 1987, he was cast in the role of a rich addict losing control of his life in the adaptation of Brett Easton Ellis' novel Less Than Zero. Nor was Iron Man his first brush with controversy, as he starred with Mel Gibson in the movie Air America in 1990. The pair have remained firm friends ever since. Of course, arguably RDJ's most prestigious work, before Iron Man, was in the 1992 movie Chaplin, wherein he played Charlie Chaplin. Sadly, after Chaplin, RDJ returned to the long dark road of drug addiction, and was arrested multiple times for drug possession, and the general idiocy and insanity that comes from being high. Even though in 2000, RDJ scored the much sought after at the time role of love interest to Ally McBeal, the demons and addictions that drove him were stronger than the desire for critical acclaim. Eventually though, RDJ decided he was tired of this endless cycle of misery, and was ready for rehab. And so, in August of 2001, Downey Jr. stood in for Elton John in the music video for the single I Want Love. Good song, that. Resonates with me personally on certain levels. From there, Woody Allen had planned to cast RDJ in the movie Melinda and Melinda, but no insurers would touch this still toxic actor. It was only when Mel Gibson stepped in to pay his insurance in 2003's The Singing Detective that the world could once again enjoy the fine acting talents of Robert Downey Jr. And so, four years clean, Robert Downey Jr. took up the mantle of Iron Man in 2007, with the film being released in 2008. And the rest, as they say, is history. Now, RDJ has mentioned in interviews that his portrayal of Iron Man has been inspired by a true-to-life genius billionaire playboy philanthropist, whose products touch our lives in more ways than you might think. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to Mr. Elon Musk. Elon Musk, genius executive of SpaceX, master of the electric cars at Tesla Motors, and driving force behind a better tomorrow. Let us begin, though, at the beginning. Born in 1971, Elon Musk's first success was in 1983, when at age 12, he programmed a game for the Atari 5200 called either Blastar or Blaster. I've come across both names in my research. Such an achievement brings to mind the UK bedroom programmers of the 80s. But none of them have parlayed their success into so diverse a portfolio. However, it was after Musk had completed school that the story begins to get really interesting. In 1999, Musk founded X.com, an online payment company, not so interesting in itself, until X.com acquired rival online payment company Confinity. Confinity's more famous subsidiary was none other than PayPal. Of course at the time, PayPal was just a very small program for the Palm Pilot. It was Musk who saw its potential, laying groundwork for it to become absolutely massive before selling it onto eBay in 2002. The company Space Exploration Technologies, or SpaceX for short, was first started in June 2002. Musk began this company with a view to landing a greenhouse on Mars. You see, in 2001, Musk had envisaged a Mars oasis, whereby a miniature greenhouse would be flown to Mars to test the viability of growing food in Martian soil. Sadly, none of the rockets at the time were up to the job, and so, he relied on the old adage, if you want something done right, do it yourself. But that's not all. Musk is also the current CEO of Tesla Motors, creator of the first fully electric sports car. He first financed the company in 2004, and was heavily involved in the development of the Roadster, which made its debut in 2006. And that's just for openers. Musk also runs solar panel company Solar City and the Musk Foundation, a charity dedicated to green energy, children's health, and science education. And most recently, he helped fund a museum dedicated to scientist Nikola Tesla, 
which is to be built on the site of Tesla's old laboratory. Genius billionaire playboy indeed. Anyway, I've rambled on long enough. Let's finish this up in the usual manner. Iron Man is a curious beast, a character you're meant to immediately hate and then grow to love. It almost seems like fate that a multiple times supposed loser seemingly fell into the role and then made it his own, to the point that it's hard to imagine anyone else in that role. Not that RDJ carries the film alone. Director Jon Favreau's masterstroke is the improvised, naturalistic dialogue. The movie flows on charismatic characters. The menace of Mickey Rourke's vengeful Vonko, the smarmy snake oil salesman shtick of Rockwell's Justin Hammer, Sam Jackson's Nick Fury, who is all business, plus of course the returning core of Stark himself and his entourage, who go without saying. And as before, so again, Iron Man 2 is both visceral and intellectual, an introspective art movie of a man in disarray, and a blockbuster spectacle where hero fights villain in a grand climax. All in all then, between both these movies, building on a slightly shaky but always entertaining past, Iron Man still has a bright future. I've been Funky Monkey, reminding you to enjoy your vices responsibly. So long, folks.